on the 20th century. Mao Zedong is dead. China after Mao. You had the pragmatists, and this included Deng Xiaoping. The unsteady rise to power of Deng Xiaoping. This man had vision and guts and, and tenacity. He created an economic miracle. The agricultural growth in China from the late 70s to the mid 80s was phenomenal. While crushing human rights. Whenever I refused to admit something, the one behind me would strike me with an electric prod. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century. For more than 25 years, Mao Zedong had ruled China with an iron fist and a little red book of revolutionary quotations. As chairman of the Chinese Communist Party and China's paramount leader, Mao had brought his country from the Middle Ages to the nuclear age almost overnight, but at an incredible cost. Millions of Chinese died in the late 50s and early 60s because of Mao's disastrous economic policy called the Great Leap Forward. Hundreds of thousands more were disgraced and hounded to death by his fanatical Red Guards during the years of the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. But by 1976, Chairman Mao was 82 and in failing health. It was a year, too, of natural disasters in China. For the second time in 16 hours, a strong earthquake has hit the People's Republic of China. This one was centered near Tongshan, an industrial city about 90 miles southeast of Peking. And as often in Chinese history, a natural disaster signaled that the gods above were making major changes down below in China. The change occurred on September 9, 1976. Mao Zedong, the man who for 27 years ruled more than a fifth of the world's population, is dead. The 82-year-old chairman of the Chinese Communist Party died today at 10 minutes after midnight Peking time. Mao was the second major Chinese leader to die in 1976. In January, the urbane premier Zhou Enlai had passed away. Unlike Mao, Zhou had been educated in Paris. While a dedicated communist revolutionary, Zhou nonetheless was believed to favor a more pragmatic course than Mao Zedong. You can see Zhou Enlai as the man, I think, who really engineered the first steps of China's transformation or change from the hardcore Maoism that culminated in the great cultural revolution to the period of adaptation that we've seen over the last 15 to 20 years. His deputy was 71-year-old Deng Xiaoping. He's regarded as an efficient bureaucrat, a member of the old guard, a pragmatist with administrative abilities. And after Mao's death, a member of one of the factions fighting to succeed the chairman. On the one hand, you had the radicals, the leftists, who didn't particularly like the opening to the U.S., who wanted to follow strictly Marxist economic policies and very fierce political repression. These were led by Chairman Mao's own wife, Madame Mao, and some other revolutionaries, essentially from Shanghai. On the other side, you had the pragmatists, and this included Deng Xiaoping, who actually went up and down in terms of his fortunes. In fact, that had been Deng's lot, throughout much of his career in the Communist Party. Born into a family of affluent landlords in 1904, he was recruited into the Communist Party by Zhou Enlai as a young student worker in France, where he acquired a taste for croissants and the game of bridge. Returning to China, Deng rose quickly in inner party circles. He was uh, one of the leaders of the Communist Revolution from the 1920s onward. He was a political commissar with the revolutionary troops. But after the Communists came to power in China in 1949, Deng moved to Beijing pretty early on, early 1950s, and became one of Mao's top lieutenants. So he was one of the right arms of Mao. Nonetheless, Deng looked to Zhou Enlai as a kind of ideological mentor. Zhou Enlai was in favor of more pragmatism, a little less extreme Marxist ideology, uh, would have been more comfortable, although he didn't push this, to move somewhat toward more capitalistic uh, economic system, and certainly Deng was in that camp. 
Those views got Dung into trouble with the radicals during the Cultural Revolution of the late 1960s. Ousted from power, Dung was forced to do menial labor. As I found out in the only one-on-one -on -one television interview Dung ever granted a Western journalist. What happened to you and to your family during the Cultural Revolution? Chairman Mao often says that a bad thing can be turned into a good thing. The key is that we must be good at summing up the experience and come up with measures of reform, both political and economic. So it was good for you to sweep floors and serve meals and split firewood and be paraded in a dunce cap. <laughs> of course it cannot be described as good things entirely, but the result is bad things have been turned into good things. Deng Xiaoping survived and in the early 1970s briefly was invited to come back because he was a very good manager, a very shrewd man. But in 1976, radical elements in the Communist Party regained the upper hand. Deng was blamed for a series of anti-government protests, and once again, he was removed. The radicals around Mao told Mao Deng is behind this. Deng has done this demonstration, and they convinced Mao that Deng was really against him. And Mao said, get rid of him. With Deng gone, Mao Zedong went on to choose a successor. And Mao could see his death coming sufficiently that he chose a fairly lackluster figure who was in the top leadership, but not one of its stars, a man named Hua Guofeng, to be his designated successor. Hua was a man from nowhere who uh, didn't have any real support. He was a junior person. Nobody ever heard of him before, but he was Mao's compromise candidate. And a successor who just one month after Mao's death arrested the leftist radicals known as the Gang of Four, believed to be responsible for many of the excesses of Mao's cultural revolution. The group included Mao's widow, Chang Qing. Reaction to the news among the Chinese was almost euphoric. And when the Gang of Four was arrested and announced as the root of all evil, uh, the release of feeling about uh, what had been wrong with Maoism was tremendous. More than a million people turned out for Hua's first public appearance. He stood on the balcony of the Gate of Heavenly Peace, where only one other man, Mao Zedong, had ever stood before as chairman of the Chinese Communist Party. Soon after Hua Guofeng came to power, Deng managed to work his way back in to government as a vice premier and to put or get a lot of his allies into other positions so that he had a big group of his own people surrounding Hua Guofeng. By outmaneuvering Hua, Deng gradually worked his way to the top, and he consolidated his position at an important party meeting in November of 1978. He didn't take an official position of power. He was still a vice premier, but he became the man who made the policies at that point. He was a feisty guy. He was only five feet tall. His feet barely touched the carpet when he sat in these big armchairs. He smoked, chain smoke continually. He used to spit in the spittoon. But he was impressive, and people always walked away feeling that this man had vision and guts and, and tenacity. That vision included building on the relationship with the United States, begun in 1972 with President Richard Nixon's trip to China. Seven years later, Deng finally returned the call, paying an official visit to Washington in January of 1979 to normalize relations with the United States. The journey from ping-pong diplomacy to full normalization of relations between China and the U.S. was climaxed at the White House this morning with this handshake between President Carter and Deng Xiaoping, the first Chinese communist leader ever to pay an official state visit to the United States. The president and the vice premier signed the two main agreements covering science and technology and cultural exchanges, while lower-ranking officials initialed implementing accords. The Chinese will now open consulates in Houston and San Francisco, while American consulates will be set up in Canton and Shanghai. Deng then went on a five-day tour of three American cities. He had enough instinct for public relations to realize he's just trying to put a human touch on the communist leaders. So whether it's going to the Kennedy Center to watch a, a cultural performance, 
or whether it's going to a rodeo in Texas and putting on a hat. Uh, he clearly was trying to show that uh, not all communists were evil. The new diplomatic relationship between the U.S. and China opened the way for a new economic relationship as well, because China's economy was at the top of Deng's agenda. By the late 70s, Deng had enacted a series of bold reforms in his effort to reverse years of economic disaster under Mao. That story, when the 20th century returns. Thank <laughs> you.